Competitive Magic the Gathering is a thing. Players around the world play against each other both online and in paper to test who truly is good at the game. Is the game decided more about luck or skill? That's down to the scientists, but the answer won't stop a competitive player firing another shot at a trophy. In this video, I'll be playing a high stakes Magic the Gathering tournament. The Popper Challenge is a high stakes popper event that happens every week. I played it last week coming 11th overall, so I thought I would record this week's event to see if I can perform similar. This deck all starts from Arbor Elf and Cheap Ramp. Popper decks can be slow in turns 1 and 2 because they play a lot of tap lands. So if you can get a land destruction spell on the early turns and follow up with a big body, you will be quick to win the game. This deck can be inconsistent at times as you do need ramp and payoff in your opening hand, but with this deck's past results, I'm sure it can hold up and it definitely makes people salty. As always, the sideboard guide for this video's deck is up on my Patreon right now. To start off the first round, we're on the play with a great opening hand with both Ramp, Payoff, and Lanowar Visionaries to help us find our extra land drops. After starting the game with an Arbor Elf, the opponent plays a Fairy, showing that they're on either Mono Blue or Blue Red Fairies, which is a tough matchup but very winnable. Now, not finding a Forest off the top is unfortunate because the opponent is guaranteed to be playing things like Counterspell, which will stop us from developing our board. And that's what the opponent does, they play their second island, attack in for one, and represent counterspell on our turn, so there's nothing better we can do but play a Lanowar Visionary because we missed our second land again. Our nightmares become a reality when the opponent uses a counterspell and we miss our second land drop for the second time. The opponent identifying where mana screwed finally ninjutsus their ninja of the deep hours into play to not only draw a card but to put a lot of pressure on us. This is the key card in their deck as it allows them to keep the cards flowing as in Pauper there isn't much card advantage. Oh, also while we're here, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you do enjoy my content, it supports me out a lot and over 70% of you aren't subscribed. While I was talking, the opponent replayed the fairy and drew a card and now we gotta cast our Lenoir Visionary to try and find another land. And after only drawing a Jewel Thief, I think you can all see where this game is going. While we did manage to hit our second land drop and start to cast our spells, we weren't in a great spot because not only did they have two ninja of the deep hours, but they managed to bounce our creatures and also make a very good block in combat because they had some combat tricks. Now I did aggressively scoop here and that's because I was double queuing playing the limited PTQ at the same time. Now I did get 7 wins and 2 losses in 9 rounds of limited, meaning I have 50 chests to open at the end of this video because we did top 16 that event. Going into boarding, we want to take out 4 land destruction spells as they are the weakest cards of the deck and bring in 2 electricries and 2 2-4 two, reaches that are very good against a lot of their creatures. Going into the second game, we have a great opening hand with lands utopia sprawl and payoff exactly what we need and we can actually cast a 3 drop on turn 2. With the opponent playing a fairy seer to scry 2, we find a scred off the top, meaning now we can play our second utopia sprawl and the jewel thief so we can hold up the scred on their turn. When we pass back, the opponent attacks in and ninjutsus the ninja of the deep hours. I decide to scred it, which I thought was a fine play because I didn't want them to draw a card, but they blow me out of the roof with a mutagenic growth from their hand to save it in combat. Now we need to draw a land so that we can slam this avenging hunter, because if not, we're going to be behind. And we get punished because we don't find the land. This is really bad for us because Avenging Hunter is almost an instant win against the opponent's deck if they can't interact with it because the Undercity is such a powerful dungeon, being able to trap and forge our Avenging Hunter, dealing 5 damage to face, putting counters on, and just swinging every turn with our trample creatures is very hard for them to beat, and even though they have flying creatures to take back the initiative, we can just attack in with our trample creatures. So we're definitely punished here for using the scred. After playing the Lanowar Visionary and finding a Wild Growth, the only thing we can do is attack him for 3 and hope they don't have good follow up. The opponent snaps my Jewel Thief back to hand and after attacking, I feel like I'm forced to block and they blow me out in combat. While it is obvious the opponent had something, I would much rather the opponent uses a card to kill my Lanowar Visionary than to let them just get a card for free by connecting with the Ninja of the Deep Hours. After finding a land off the top, we're just going to replay our Jewel Thief to try and stop this Ninja of the Deep Hours. The opponent doesn't like that, they bounce it back to my hand, ninjutsu back the combat trick to hand, and draw two cards. With the opponent tapped down low, I'm just going to slam the annoyed ultasaur as it is a 6-5 reach trample cascade. That cascade finds a scred, we're going to target a ninja of the deep hours, but they do have blue elemental blast to stop it resolving. After passing back the turn, the opponent surprises me by attacking him with everything. I'm obviously going to block the ninja, and they have double mutagenic growth to kill my annoyed Ultisar and to keep the ninja of the deep hours alive. 
I wasn't feeling too confident going into this turn with the opponent having counterspell mana up, but with the Jewel Thief and Spider resolving, I thought that the spot was becoming okay. The opponent untaps, instantly passes back, so I'm just going to cast the Avenging Hunter because they didn't have counterspell last turn, so they probably don't have it this turn. And that assumption was correct, we get to resolve the Avenging Hunter, we gain the initiative, and now we can get the basic mountain out of our deck and pass back to the opponent. They flash in a Spell Stutter Spray on my end step and attack him with both flyers, so while they do get the initiative, we get to eat the Spell Stutter Spray, and they pass back the turn. With the land off the top, the best thing we can do is attack him with both creatures with Trample, as any Trample damage that hits the opponent will give us back the initiative. After flashing in another Spell Stutter Sprite, the opponent blocks everything but allows two Trample damage to go over from the Jewel Thief, so we get back the initiative. I think the opponent forgot that Jewel Thief had Trample, so now we get it back, and we can kind of screw them over. After sacrificing their whole board in combat, kind of seemed like the opponent didn't have much else to follow up with, and we managed to win the game just by playing two Cascade creatures off the top. That was quite an unfortunate play. Similarly, in game three, it was quite grindy, but we managed to win just because we have double boarding party and Cascade is really good against the control deck. While both players made mistakes, it's nice we came out on top. It's always nice to start off a tournament at 1-0. Now going into round two, we have to mulligan our opening seven and then our opening six, because again, we have to have both ramp and some sort of spells to make sure that our hand is consistent. Now finding this one with wild growth and lands is good enough on a multi five, especially on the draw. The opponent starts off with an island, which makes me worried I'm gonna be playing against fairies again, but after passing back and leading with the wild growth, they have a thought scour on our end step to show that they're the blue black self mill terror Gurmag angler deck. The opponent just hits their second island and we find an arbor elf, so now we can arbor elf and land and on our end step they do nothing, kind of implying they have a counter spell. With the opponent playing their third island and passing back, we do find a land off the top which lets us cast boarding party, but I'm definitely sure that they're going to have a counter spell for our creature. Finding a land or our visionary is great because not only did we mulligan, but they have the counter spell, so we get to draw a card for the exchange. Finding a second boarding party is amazing, but they have a black source and a snuff out to kill my arbor elf and stop me from casting the boarding party this turn. So all we can do is attack him with the Lenoir Visionary and say go and hope they don't have some pressure. As they do have access to black mana, the opponent delves out their whole graveyard to cast a Gurmag Angler, and now we have to find either a red source for the Scred or some more snow permanence. That Utopia sprawls a red source, so now we can play that, name red, and double Scred the Gurmag Angler to at least have some more pressure on the opponent. With the opponent tapping out for a deep analysis and playing an island holding up spell pierce, we don't care because we're going to go boarding party into boarding party and there isn't much they can do unless they have another snuff out. Now for the rest of the game, obviously they couldn't deal with it, so we won because of triple boarding party off the top. That's pretty decent, but don't forget we did mulligan to five, so I guess sometimes you gotta get lucky to win these games. Now there's only one slight problem, and that's this was the last game I won in this tournament. For the rest of this round, the opponent had a ton of counter spells and pressure to both disrupt our board, but also with mulligans in both games 2 and games 3, we were just low on ramp and threats, and it just wasn't working out for us. Having one win and one loss was fine, but then getting paired against mono red and not being able to find our sideboard weather the storms in games 2 just made things rough, and with our boarding party cascading into a scred and not a blocker, made it so that they could protect their monastery swift sphere, and we lost. In round 4, we managed to get insane value with Acid Moss, destroying a land with a Utopia Sprawl on it, but the opponent was playing the Defender's combo deck, meaning that we couldn't disrupt their mana when we had the Stone Rain heavy draw. It was very awkward. We lost round 4 because the opponent assembled Utopia Sprawl, plus a Forest, plus Arbor Elf, plus Freed from the Reel on the Arbor Elf to make infinite mana and to venture into the dungeon infinite times with the Doorkeeper. From here, there wasn't really anything else I could do but drop from the tournament as it just wasn't being my day for the Popper format. Now while Popper went bad, Limited went really well, coming top 16 in a 300 player event. So here are those 50 chests for you gambling degenerates. Don't forget to like and subscribe and check out this video because YouTube thinks you'll like it and thanks to my Patreons.